to welcome our next guest, uh, Mr. Benjamin Hartig. Uh, ben Hartig is an engineer with the Desert Cloud Ball Network at Curtin University. Uh, the focus of his work is hardware development of for fireball imaging. He's uh, working towards his PhD, looking at how to leverage emerging nanosat technologies for planetary science objectives. So um, I'll leave it to you, Ben. Cool. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm an engineer with the Desert Cloud Ball Network. I'm used to talking to rooms of people who really are sick of us. So I've actually dropped some really interesting slides out of my talk. And you guys probably don't know all that much about us. So uh, we're a group from Curtin University. We're actually a planetary science group focusing on uh, meteorites. So we're really interested in fireballs. So that's the really bright luminescent event uh, when a bit of rock goes in through our atmosphere. And hopefully for us, it doesn't burn up. So we look for we look for the meteorites on the ground that come from the really bright events that, that drop those meteorites. And we do that with a, a network of cameras. Uh, our goal is to collect the rocks with known orbits. So there's roughly 10,000, well, there's more than 10,000 uh, meteorite samples in collections around the world. Uh, under 40 of those have known orbits. And a known orbit, what that does is it lets you link that rock back to its parent body. So an asteroid, Mars, the moon, hopefully comets sometime soon. Um, yeah, and it also lets you think about impact rates, how much material is actually impacting Earth and uh, making it to ground or burning up in the atmosphere. So at the moment we have about three million kilometers squared coverage and I should have included a nice picture of our Australian network, which, which actually is about two and a half million kilometers squared of that, uh, which stretches from Perth to Broken Hill at about 150 kilometer increments. There's about 50 in our segment of the network, but we actually have uh, recently acquired 12 partner networks. So we've got um, our hardware going out to collaborators in Australia and around the world, and they're gonna build up networks. Because as we found out, managing 50 remote observatories is actually a lot of work, uh, especially when you have other research goals to work on. Um, so this is our uh, Global Fireball Observatory, is how we've dubbed it. Um, we've got 62 systems in Australia. Uh, we've got uh, Saudi Arabia, Morocco, uh, the UK, Canada and around the US. Uh, there's several different groups. And this is what they look like. So it's, it's basically a, a little computing box with a camera, some solar gear, some batteries. And we thought to ourselves, well, we're already trying to do a lot of things that we would do with a CubeSat. And there's some pretty cool things we could do with our network if we had a CubeSat. So we thought, OK, what observation challenges have we got? And what have we achieved so far? Um, a big one for us was the absolute timing. So we have 50, 50 cameras in Australia in our network and all the um, collaborators' cameras. If we see the same thing, we want to know we're looking at the same image at the same time. So we've actually, um, one of our PhDs developed a De Bruijn sequence encoded into a long exposure image, which gives us millisecond accuracy on each point along the fireball. So this is a, actually a picture of a very, very bright fireball. And in the, ooh, maybe this was away from it. So you can actually see the encoding, which looks a bit like Morse code in the fireball event. Uh, this is actually not a great image. Uh, you can see here this very, very bright section, which was our uh, next major challenge was dynamic range. So when you're trying to look at something that's quite possibly faint or something that's extremely bright, you have to pick your optics in such a way that allow you to optimize for both. So we've actually started um, hacking away, I guess, at uh, the off-the-shelf components that we use, so cameras in this case. Um, to be able to control apertures and stuff independently from the way they're intended to be used. Uh, so, so we can, we actually haven't got any uh, field data yet, but we can, we can actually step down during this segment and get the nice clean room image now. But we still can't deal with the atmosphere, atmospheric effects uh, like most ground obser observations. We, we've got unconstrained errors that we'd like to solve, and so we've stared a lot at a picture of a, a, meteorite, no, sorry, a meteor from the ISS captured during the Perseids meteor shower. Uh, we thought if we could get some pictures like that that we can also see in our network, we could really constrain some of the errors that we've, we've got at the moment. Uh, so we've got some objectives <laughs> to build a CubeSat. And I need to say, we haven't got a CubeSat. We haven't got a launch. We haven't really got anything yet. Uh, but that's why I'm here. Uh, you guys have. And we'd love to work with you guys, so if you've got any suggestions or help, we're really uh, excited to be part of the community and, and to learn from your experience. 
because we're a concrete scientists and we specialize in, in the, the rock stuff. Uh, but we do want to correlate observations, and fortunately we have a, we have the big network, uh, oh, oh, that. Um, but we haven't really got the experience. So, so we want to start building that over in Western Australia as well. So Kern Uni want to invest in um, developing CubeSat experience for the engineering students. So that's a really great opportunity for us and for working with you guys. So far, we've just gone, okay, what if we bought an off-the-shelf system from some of the big commercial providers? And listening to that last talk in the last session, I was like, <coughs> yeah, that's a crap problem to try and solve. Uh, we've been looking at it, we haven't solved it. We've gone, oh, well, we could probably get this, and we could probably get that. Um, we'd like to work with more off-the-shelf stuff because we want to focus on the stuff that we do well, which is the imaging payload. We've got years of experience in imaging viables, and we want to apply that from all of it. So at the moment, we're looking at, uh, Space and ISIS, they're the people that mainly talk to us. But the biggest problem we've got is how do you get someone to deliver a bus to you? Because uh, most of the people we've talked to, uh, they can't actually deliver. They haven't given us good delivery timelines. They haven't uh, really provided a, a full solution. It's like, oh, you could get a bit from here and a bit from there. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, other than GOM Space and Tieback, and that's a bit out of our price range. Uh, <coughs> Some other projects have looked at meteors from CubeSats. Uh, S-Cube was one by Chitek and Tohoku University. Um, they uh, put a CubeSat up with a camera, a uh, hyperspectral imager, and um, looked at meteors. But they looked at meteors and meteor showers, and these guys tend not to drop rocks, and we really want those rocks on the ground. So the same is true of Meteorix, which is a, a uh, is actually a French fireball network, doing very similar work to us using video. Um, and they're also looking at, at um, mainly meteor shower events. Uh, meteor is another uh, event <coughs> by Chitek, which is a camera on the ISS. Uh, same again, looking at meteor showers. So there's a bit of a hole in the area that we're most interested in, and that's getting the meteorite, because the meteorite gives you the sample of rock that matches the apparent body, which is sort of like a cheap version of a sample return mission. Uh, a very cheap version. <laughs> Uh, another way of doing this is data repurposing. So there's been some interesting looking at uh, all these Earth images. Sometimes you get this annoying streak in your image that's ruining the data you want. We want that streak. So if anyone's doing Earth imaging and you have these annoying streaks in your data, please come to us because we may be able to correlate your streaks with our streaks and that would be a really cool paper. Uh, so finally, I guess this is what our triangulations look like now. This is uh, my favorite event because I was, I was out in the desert when it happened. I got to fly on a small plane over Lake Eyre and, and look for a crater impact on Lake Eyre and then eventually see the rock back in our lab. Uh, I'd like to see our triangulations looking like this, with that extra element in space constraining <coughs> some of those other areas. We're a long way from that, and uh, if you've got any ideas or any way to help us, we'd love to talk to you. I'm here today and tomorrow. Um, so yeah, please approach me. I don't know who to approach, there's so many people. <laughs> uh, and lastly, I guess, I want to plug our app. So we've got this really cool app, which is a bit of an outreach project, but it's actually turned out to be really useful. So it's a citizen science project. Um, basically, if you are out there looking for your CubeSat and you see a fireball, grab your phone, have our app on it, point it where you saw it, record where you saw it travel. That will use your GPS and your uh, accelerometer in your phone. It will send a report to us. We'll look in our massive database of fireballs. To give you an idea, we have some, something coming close to 10 petabytes worth of data. Uh, it's a lot of data. We have uh, well over a thousand triangulated events. Um, we've got a ton of rocks on the ground. We don't have enough people to look for them, so also if you want to walk through the desert for two weeks looking at your feet, we'd love to have you. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, we've had app sightings all over the world. We've got people using it. Uh, we've actually had someone in Western Australia sitting in her lounge room, see a fireball, get out her app record it, and then come down to our lab and hold that rock in their hands. And there's not many people in the world that can say that they've done that. So really, please use our app. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's all I've got. So I'm not sure how quick that was. We've got time for one question. OK. You talk about trying to improve the triangulation for uh, re-entry. Yep. Have you looked at trying to correlate against radio observations and radio observations? That's quite a few groups. So. Yeah, we've got, we've got a lot of collaborations. We're actually... Um, we got, we got a little picture of there in, uh, I think it was Brad's talk, of the Fire Opal network, which is an offshoot from our Fireball network. 
Uh, that's the uh, space situational awareness one. And through that, we've met a lot of guys, great guys in radar who are starting to work with us. Uh, in America, <laughs> radar is the best for meteorites. Um, but we just obviously don't have the coverage here of um, Doppler radar that they have in the US. <coughs> yeah. I just have a quick question. Seeing as how a lot of people probably have like three phones just sitting in their drawers, have you considered potentially developing an app which allows people to hook their phone up to you know, their own internet and potentially a solar power device and chuck it on their roof and point at the sky so you have feed going on? Um, there's similar projects. We've, um, we look at really high resolution. So we're looking at 36 megapixel images on a 180 degree fisheye lens. Uh, <coughs> We do want all the data, so. Yeah, but that's uh, like it. people are pointing their phones. And but that is a really cool project, yeah. So that, that's mainly focused on this cell or another. Uh, okay. yeah. Just quickly, <clears throat> would your dynamic range need to change on your camera, your imaging system, well, if you put it on a CubeSat? Um, yeah, I mean, it's gonna be a different problem with dynamic range. Uh, at the moment, we sort of arrest control of the sensors from the off-the-shelf camera. We're looking at more like, base level <laughs> from, from sensors themselves based on the experience we've got so far. But yeah, uh, it's, it's definitely a problem we're working on, but we're in early days. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's the last question. Uh, maybe we can see you later at break. I'll be here uh, for a week. Oh no, two days. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um,